Hello everyone, this is Elonzo. Want to know how to get your first cloud job? Then please register for our webinar. We'll teach you everything that you need to know and answer your questions along the way. Hope to see you there. Hello everyone, this is Elonzo. Want to know how to get your first cloud job? Then please register for our webinar. We'll teach you everything that you need to know and answer your questions along the way. Hope to see you there. My name is Richard Furr, and I can say I am cloud hired. That yes, come and join and get cloud hired. I'm cloud hired. I'm cloud hired. I'm cloud hired. Hey, go, go cloud architect family. I'm cloud hired. I'm cloud hired, guys. So I'll just say I'm cloud hired. I'm cloud hired. I'm cloud hired. Thanks to go cloud architects. It worked for me, and now I'm cloud hired. Because because of Google Architect program, I am cloud hired. See! I am cloud hired. Thank you, Mike and the Glow Cloud team. Welcome everyone. Hi, my name is Mike Gibbs. I'm the founder and CEO of GoCloud Careers, and I'm here with Alonzo Coleman from my team. And we're here to help you build your technology career. Maybe you'd like to learn the things you need to learn to get your first cloud architect job, or AWS Solutions Architect job, or Azure Solutions Architect job, or maybe you desire to become an enterprise architect or a network architect, whatever it is, we're here to help you. I've personally been an architect now for 25 years whether it be a network architect, an enterprise architect, you name it, even a business architect, I've done all the architect roles. And I've spent more than two decades helping people just like you get your first tech job, get promoted in tech, 
negotiate a big raise and I want to help you today. So our graduates work at Apple, at Amazon, and Cisco, and IBM, and Microsoft, and Google, and Palo Alto Networks, and KPMG, Accenture, Deloitte, Capgemini, and any prestigious organization you can think of. And you know, it's been my life's mission to help people get better jobs. I left practicing internal medicine as a nurse practitioner many years ago, went into tech, loved it, and thought everybody needed to, that wanted a good job to work in tech because it's a passion of mine. So that's why we're here. So come and ask us your career questions. Before we ask, answer your questions on how to build your architect career, I'd like to tell you about some free things we have to help you. So first, tomorrow we have an absolutely free webinar on getting your first cloud architect job. We will cover the role, what we actually do as cloud architects, which is completely different than the certification. We will talk about all the skills that you need. We'll talk about how to get hired when you have no experience and literally get past those HR people that will auto-reject you and how to go straight to the hiring manager. And it'll be on Zoom so we can answer any questions you have to build your best career. And again, it's all free tomorrow. While we're at it, we have a document. It's an ebook we wrote on how to get your first cloud architect job. My team will provide a link for that both in the chat box and the description below. It's completely free and it will cover the entire role, all the skills and everything you need to do to get that first job of yours. And while we're at it, Maybe you don't desire to be an architect, or maybe you're an architect and you want to make more money, or maybe you want to be a tech professional and earn more. We have a free document, the free book that we wrote on why tech skills are not enough and those other skills that you need to earn more. So take advantage of these opportunities. We'll be waiting for your questions. And then Alonzo, would you like to welcome everyone? Absolutely, everyone. Thank you all for joining us. We really appreciate your time. Just like we said yesterday, we had a lot of amazing questions and a lot of detailed answers to help you along your cloud architecture and enterprise trajectory. So bring them here again today. We're here to help and we're looking forward to it. Okay, so bring us your questions. Full of shocking. Why is the engineer's, software engineer's job so drastically difficult than the architect's? Well, Fala Shaki, everything is subjective. You know, I know people that can squat 800 pounds and it's easy for them. And I know other people that can squat 50 pounds and they look like they're going to die because it's so hard for them. So everything is subjective. I will tell you my experience in both engineering and architecture and why I feel it's so much easier to be an architect than an engineer. But, you know, your mileage may vary because you may find it difficult to do some of these architect things, and you may find coding and sitting behind a desk all day easy. So personally for me, the reason I think the architect's job is easier because I don't have to touch the tech ever. I don't have to touch the tech. I don't have to debug the tech. I don't have to fix the tech. I don't have any of those headaches that you get each day when there's things that you need to know and you don't know them. So for me, it's a lot, I'm an architect. So what do I do? I talk to my clients. I ask my clients some questions. I build some teams, I lead some teams, I write architecture documents, I present at conferences, I write thought leadership documents, I respond to RFIs, RFPs, RFQs, I negotiate business deals and I entertain clients. And I gotta tell you, I also lead and facilitate a lot of meetings and I will tell you as an architect, there's a lot of meals and a lot of meeting facilitation. So, which is easier for you? To me, it's easier to have a conversation than to sit behind a desk and to stare and type on that thing feverishly and when it doesn't work, go figure it out. But that's for me. I mean, for me, if I had to sit at a desk like this, I'd get a new job. I mean, I, I'd hate it. I'd be terribly depressed. It would make me miserable. And I did spend six months as an, well, I was an engineer for six months. And I will say that uh, I moved into architecture about three months into it. And I will tell you that engineering to me was the most pain I ever had in any job in my entire life. But that's me. But as an architect, I took people out to dinner. So I thought it was easier to take somebody people for steak and lobster and shrimp and nice and nice seafood than it actually was to sit behind a desk. But that's me. If somebody's shy and afraid to talk to people, it might be easier to sit behind a desk and code than it actually would be to entertain clients. You know, going to a meeting and speaking in front of executives. You know, to go out there and spend an entire day on an airplane flight, and I would usually fly first class, which meant I had good meals along the way and occasionally a little bit of champagne, but let's not talk about that. And, you know, I'd show up, I'd give a speech, and it was like, Mike, uh, go have dinner with a client, you know, go in the next day to the office, kiss some babies, talk to some people on my contact list to make sure I can keep those relationships. And then the next day, fly home instead of working. I'd sit on an airplane, I'd watch some movies. 
I might work on some presentations, might work some documents, but you know, it was easy for me. So for me, it's easy. Now, if you have to pin me down to sit behind a desk, for me, that's like some form of torture. I'd rather be waterboarded, and I'm not joking, <laughs> behind a desk all day long. It's just for me, that's me, but we all are different. And we all find different things pleasurable versus painful. And that's really the key. And I don't get to do it every day like I used to because I've had some injuries. But for me as a kid, I would like to do powerlifting and Olympic weightlifting. That was fun for me. Now, I've tried to take friends powerlifting. And they looked at me and said, Mike, this is torture. I don't ever want to go there. So all these things are really subjective. So to me, it's a lot easier. But you got to think about you, your goals, your dreams, your desires, your likes, your dislikes. And then you're there. Alan, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, absolutely. Um, I, I think what's important is, I guess I got some background feedback there. I think what what's, I guess, difficult is, like you said, it's subjective, Mike. I, I'm thinking that if you don't like it or you're not familiar or it makes you uncomfortable, it's going to be difficult for you. So case in point, I'm a people person. I love to get in front of uh, business leaders, talk about solutions, talk about options. And that roadmap to get her, get us from uh, the future, uh, the present to the future state versus me. Uh, years ago, I tried getting into Terraform. I tried to get into Python. I tried to get into Linux. I tried very, very hard and I just couldn't do it. It was very painful for me. So if it's your passion to be a self software engineer, go for it. This language is going to be easy for you. Multiple languages are going to be easy for you. And being in front of the command line all day, you'll lose track of time because this is your passion versus what I like to do. So for Shaki, I'm not sure if um, there's an objective perspective to that, but it's all about what you like to do, what you want to do, and what you're looking uh, to have as your career. Is it commonplace for cloud architects to liaise with representatives from other vendors, such as sales representatives from uh, Oracle or MongoDB? Falashaki, absolutely. We're an architect. There's We have to coordinate all of the vendors that we work with. There's almost never, like 99% of the time, you're never going to have an all Azure or an all Google or an all AWS. Well, let's be fair. In 98% of the time, you're going to have more than one cloud. And... Again, you're going to be using the tools that the cloud provider doesn't provide you for multiple industrial things. So it's constant. But, you know, here's who we're going to liaise with. You know, every time we deal with a sales rep, they're usually going to have a sales engineer with them. And the sales engineer is going to be that techie person that we can ask the technical questions to. And that sales rep is going to be the person that buys dinner and drinks when they meet with us, which is very commonplace as well. So I want you to think about it that way. We architects have to collaborate. And that's why we architects can't be talking to pe I mean, typing code or configuring technology. We're gonna have to speak and collaborate with the executives. We'll have to collaborate with the department heads. We'll have to collaborate in between the cloud providers. We'll have to collaborate with the networking vendors, the security vendors, the application vendors, and that's our whole job. So yes, incredibly commonplace for us to work with people in different environments. Have to, have to, have to. I'd say about 20 to 25% of my time is coordinating vendors in a typical architecture. Good question. Yeah, it's really good. You think about all the multi-cloud implementation, Mike, and trying to find more efficiencies in hand-in-glove approaches to enterprises and overall cloud. So you really want to speak to everyone involved, whoever's focused, if they're focused on security, if they're focused on edge, if they're focused on databases, you want to find out who's going to be the best fit for your particular environment. So that takes discussions. It takes um, RFPs. It takes understanding who you're working with, their culture, and how it integrates with your own particular culture with your organization. So uh, it goes right back to what we teach about CXO relevancy, soft skills, business skills, emotional intelligence, communication skills, and being able to leverage and actually negotiation skills and leveraging all of that to get the best value, efficiencies, and optimization for your business and company that you work for. Tin Man, if you want to move into the tech field in the architect role, are, uh, are there any roles that might be helpful for me to perform while moonlighting to develop the architect skills? Got to keep income coming in. Totally understand. 
Tim Mama, I totally get it. So, and if you would be in sales, that would boost your architect skills. And here's why. What do we do as clients? We learn to, to gather information on, on, on the customer's needs. We have to build teams and convince people to want to work on these teams. And then we have to ultimately convince people to work for us, people to do their jobs. And then we've got to convince the customer to buy our solution. So if I ever had an example of the best career to join before being an architect, it'd either be practicing medicine or sales. So anytime you're in a consultative, consultative environment where you have to ask people their needs and you have to come up with a creative solution, you're really doing the architect's job and it's good. Now, I, I wish I could say if you worked as an engineer, that would teach you architect skills, but it doesn't. And sadly, you know, I take, I've had people come to me, they've done thousands of cloud projects, but they're all how to projects. I have somebody I'm working with right now who's been a cloud engineer for 10 years, and he's the most deeply technical person you need. And it took us about a year and a half to actually get his soft skills and communication skills up to the point where his management said, okay, we see you as an architect now. And so it's that. But I'd say if you could work in sales, it would be there. Now, I've actually had some pretty good success with people. I mean, medical background, obviously, but you know, you're not going to go to school for that and have to get a license for something. But, medic, but medical, why? Because you're asking people, you have to be emotionally intelligent. So any role where you're going to have to communicate a lot, have to gather information a lot, is going to be very good for you as an architect. So kind of think about that. If you are in any place where you need to do that. So in high-end customer service, you're actually doing a lot of things. Now, I don't mean the customer service people you call when Amazon delivered the wrong thing and you go to the website it doesn't work and then you get one of those people that's customer service and amazon's good at that they provide really good customer service but i'm talking about higher end customer service where you've got the power to be able to align resources give give financial return back you know be able to bring in a team of people to make the customer happy if you could do anything like that and what i will say is say if you had any opportunity to do some project management that would also be good for you. And here's the reason why. Project management is about leading teams and making sure deliverables are done. And if you can become more, less of a taskmaster and more of an executive, again, that would be good. So these would be the things that would really uh, give you the best access to architecture training and experience while you're training to be an architect. Back to Fola Shockey. For architects, does whether or not an architect entertain their client depend on their seniority or who their specific client is? Fala Shaki, your, your job as an architect is design a solution, present a solution, and sell a solution. I'm going to give you a secret. Nobody buys from you if they don't like you. So nobody's going to give you any information if they don't like you. And in most cases, when you deal with a client, they've made a lot of mistakes. So... For all clients, for the most part, if they matter enough to you to get their business, you're going to be entertaining them. There are no architects except for the interns, which are called associate architects, but they're not architects, that won't be entertaining clients. You have to. Well, Ashaki, I can tell you I remember about 20 years ago, I got pulled into my manager's office for the strangest complaint you've ever would have imagined. And my manager said, Mike, you only spent $4,000 last month entertaining clients. What the heck are you doing? And I was like, huh? He says, go spend some money. If you're not spending money on your clients and you're not hanging out with your clients, you're not bringing value because they're not going to buy from us. Go, go spend some money on your clients. So please understand, relationship development is key for us. Now, I want you to think about it this way. If I take, you know, let's say you are my client, Fulashaki, and today I take you to Morton's uh, for some steak and some lobster and, some, and maybe a bottle of silver oak wine, and we've got some nice potatoes over there and some cream spinach. They make really good spinach at Morton's Park. And then afterward, you know, we have some Macallan 18 or Macallan 25. I send you home in a car service, and I take a car service home. You know, I'm at your place the next day. You're giving me some information while I'm over there. Would you like to get together for lunch? You take them for lunch. Next week, you're back in that office. You're talking to them. The next week, you're talking to them. Hey, while we're here, I'm going to go to the bar. McAllen 25 is on me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure, you're going to the bar. You're having some really good scotch. Look at the relationship you'll have. And when people drink a little, they'll say, these are my real problems. 
hey, when they drink a little, they'll say, you know, to win this bid, you got to do this. I really like you. And I want to give you this strategy hand. We'll give you insight. So you want to be have strong relationship with your client. And guess what? You're going to be meeting up with other architects and other account managers and other specialists as well because you need their relationship. So, yep, understand this is a person-to-person -person position, which is really great. All these people-to-people -people positions cannot be replaced by artificial intelligence. And they're the hardest people to lay off because we bring money into the business. So when you're revenue generating, when you're customer facing, it is the most secure and high pay, highest paying jobs out there. So Lonzo, you want to add to that a little bit? Uh, yeah, I couldn't I couldn't have said it better. There is a science to relationship building. There is it's an art form as well as a science. You think about put yourself in the in the vendor's shoes or the client's shoes. They want to know how you tick, how you represent the company, how do you move, how do you uh, because if you represent yourself this way, odds are you're going to represent the organization the same way. How you uh, how you sit at the dinner table, what you order, how you communicate uh, your order to um, uh, the perspective of uh, Mater D, if you will, or the waiter or the waitress. These things matter because how you do things there is going to be how they're going to assume you do th uh, business with communicating with engineers, developers, programmers, bringing everything that they're asking you, the representative, to bring the life for their solution. So think about how you would entertain. That, that requires uh, some reconnaissance, understanding what this person likes, what they don't like, where they like to go, where they like to frequent, the gifts that they like to bring their family, who their family is, sons, daughters, children, ages, interests, colleges, being able to remember these things and pull them out of your mental repertoire and add towards any discussion, they love that. Because at the end of the day, the happier you make the client, the more money they'll spend, the more money they'll spend, the more the organization makes. And at the end of the day, the more bonuses, commissions, and opportunities for promotion you will get. So it's cyclic. So continue to grow in understanding your clients and you're gonna win. Brad, uh, Brady. What is the current state of the market for aspiring cloud architects? I'm graduating with a degree in business information systems. Uh, hold the AWS Solutions Architect, or rather, he holds the AWS Solutions Architect certificate and is looking to. Is there a part two to this, Tyrone? Looking to join the program. However, I have no relevant experience. How hard will it be for me to get hired? Brady Bowman, good, Brady Bowman, good question. And when I see your name, I finally think of a person, Brandon Bowman, who took our program and ended up getting a nice promotion. A really great guy from the Marine Corps, really, really terrific person. So if you're related, great. So here's what I will tell you. Overall, the aggregate demand for cloud architects is incredibly strong and it's growing. And the demand for architects gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And here's the reason why. We've got all these new cool technology tools. We've got some of these sassy wide area networking solutions, which is pretty cool, especially for remote access workers. We have artificial intelligence, which you know we've had for 20, 30 years, but we have a lot more with generative AI now. We have a lot more options when it comes to data and big data and machine learning and, and gleaning information from the data. So we're now in a world where companies need people. Now, guess what, Brady? They need people that can design a solution that makes an impact on a business. And that's really the key. And somebody else asked a cost question, which we'll like later, but it doesn't matter the cost. It matters the impact. So 50 some percent of cloud architectures are complete disasters. They actually hurt the business that moved to the cloud. And that's because it took a tech first approach. Somebody took a certification, they got all excited by the services they did, and then they pushed the client into a technology that they thought was right without knowing the client's business. So organizations are getting rid of those people and they're looking for architect, architects, those business executive leaders, and they're willing to pay and they're willing to pay well. We've reached a point where the architect, the enterprise architect is probably the most strategic person in the entire organization. That cloud architect, especially if it's doing enterprise architect roles, like a lot of my students do, becomes the most strategic person in the technology organization. Why? Because they're the people that can learn for the business needs, learn the business goals, and then ultimately, design a solution to maximize that business performance. And Brady, I want you to think about this. You've got a company like Microsoft, quarter of a million people work for them and they made about $72 billion last year. 
Imagine if some consultant could come in there and say, I can increase your earnings by 2% with this technology solution. Think about the magnitude of 2% of 70 some billion dollars. I got to tell you, it's it's a lot more than you would imagine this in tens of millions of dollars. So that's why architects are needed. Architects are an extraordinary demand and there's nearly any supply. And here's the reason. All the people that want to be architects don't know what an architect is, and they're getting certifications like the AWS Solutions Architect Professional. They're learning how to code. They're learning how to configure. They're learning Linux. They're learning DevOps. They're learning Python, which has absolutely nothing to do with our job. So, Brady, and please come to my our webinar tomorrow where we're going to have a free, uh, free webinar. We'll go over the skills, but it's a great opportunity. Now, I will also tell you the economy feels very soft now, and this is not the best time to be searching for a job. It really isn't, but you know, here's what we talk about in the economy. For those of us uh, that have a heavy economics background, like me and Alonzo, we have what's called business cycles, and they're typically about eight years in general. And what happens is we start here, we go sky, 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 sky high, and then it goes down, 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 and then it goes up, 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 and then it goes down, 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 and it goes up, 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 and then it goes down, down, down. So you know, these things are cyclical. I've been through all kinds of these. Uh, I've been through several economic meltdowns and several economic booms in my years in technology. And actually, I joined in 2001. Two, and around, well, it's not true. I started in like 96, but around 2000, that's when I was part of the big dot-com bubble. Of course, I never got laid off. I managed to stay in it, but I saw it constrict. And then I saw the hiring go boom, boom, boom. So it's a great time. How hard will it for you be to get hired? It depends if you do the work or if you don't do the work. Now I'll tell you when you have no experience, in my experience, about one out of three hiring managers will be willing to hire you. One out of three, if you deliver a good interview. Two out of three, no, but one out of three, but they're still pretty good and pretty strong odds. And Brady, everybody gets their first job. Every physician gets their first job. As, as a physician, every airplane pilot gets their first job as an airplane pilot. Every pharmacist gets their first job. As a pharmacist, every lawyer gets their first job. You know, for me, I see it every day. I was just talking to Ian Rowe yesterday about what a great architect he's have time he's having working in the UK. But you know, it's, you're not the only one with no experience that gets hired. I mean, we I think about Yvonne Tamba. Why do I always start with Yvonne? Because this guy was a fireball and he came to us, and a couple months later he was hired by AWS with no experience. I think about Coyote the same reason, because these two kids were just awesome rock stars, came to us, no experience, got hired. Richard Afukar came with to, to us three weeks later. We got him a technical account manager job at Amazon. Never worked in tech before. You know, and I look at people like Jeffrey West, who was doing geospatial imaging. His first job was a solution architect after our training. And Richard Ferrari, who I really liked, this guy was like working in a fraud department in a bank, you know, not tech fraud, but regular fraud. And we trained him. And, you know, as soon as he graduated our program, he, un uh, he ended up with a job as a, what do you call it, a cloud architect at MUFG Bank. So it really doesn't matter, you know, Lenny Burnett was our video editor and what a rock star editor is, rock star videographer, loves his photography just like I do. But we worked with him and he got hired at Citrix as a solution architect. And Delroy Bat was a 24-year-old kid, really good, fun guy from the Caribbean, comes and visits me in Florida all the time. I really like the kid. Got him a cloud security architect job. And, you know, I could go on with like this all day, Brady, but, you know, here's the thing. It's not going to be the easiest thing you've ever done. But you can do it, and that's the key. And here's the thing. Nothing easy is really worthwhile anyway. Here's what's easy. I mean, it's not easy. It's hard. But here's what's easy. Going to McDonald's and getting a job as a fry cook. Lots of positions open for that. But the life that you have there and the work will be horrible. Move it up a couple levels, and getting the job is harder. And the balance, what do you call it, the the what it the the, the ugh, I'm thinking I'm tongue tied on words, but the barrier to entry, which that's what I wanted to say, is a lot harder. But once you're there, it's a much easier job, and you're paid a lot more. So Brady, I'm sure you will do totally fine if we worked with you. I'm sure you'll learn the good skills. I'm sure you'll build a career for us uh, with us that you can't even imagine. It'll be beyond your wildest dreams. But it's not going to be the easiest thing. But neither was my MBA. Neither was Alonzo's MBA. Neither was learning internal medicine. That wasn't super easy. Neither was passing the CCIA. But you know what? I did it. And, I, and I've watched people do it every single day of the week, and you can too. So 
train with us, believe in yourself, and don't quit until you win. And when life gets tough, adapt, improvise, and overcome, and you'll get to any goals that you want in life. So that'd be my my guidance for you, uh, Brady. Alonzo, you're more than welcome to provide some guidance here if you desire as well. Um, yeah, if you echo the, the same premise that I would, um, Brady, just get the competency competency, competency, and competency. Don't worry. And, and let's clarify, there's no coding involved with this. Your focus should be on understanding the technology, what it is, what it does, when you would use it, and how it helps transform businesses. Couple that with the business side of it. <clears throat> communication, um, understanding uh, your client, their needs, the, the culture, uh, communication, soft skills, uh, CXO relevancy, emotional intelligence, a lot of, of everything that we incorporate within our development program. The more you know, the more you focus, the more your outcome will be for a success. So I encourage you to do that. Simon, what are the differences between a cloud architect and an enterprise architect in balancing performance and cost for cloud solutions? Simon, let me kind of tell you the difference between cost and value. <laughs> None of our jobs are balancing cost. That's thin up. But let's talk about, so I wanted to talk to you about two things, Simon. I've got two, two writing implements over here. On the left hand, I'm going to sell you this pencil for 25 cents. And you know what you can do with this pencil? Right. Now, in my right hand, I've got a magic pen. And if you have this pen in your hand, You'll be able to close any deal you want. You'll be able to sell any billion dollar solution you want, any $10 billion solution you want, or even, even million dollar solution. And I charge you $10 million for this pen. Which do you think is cheaper? The magic pen, which can do a trillion dollars of business, or the 25 cent pencil? This would be an expense, and this would be an asset. So I don't want you to think that our job is working on cost. If you're thinking about cost as your primary thing, you're not thinking in architecture, you're thinking engineering. So we have to understand what the value. If I create an, an environment for my customer, Simon, that saves them 30% on their tech costs, but does absolutely nothing for them and doesn't do, provide any business value whatsoever, I hurt them. Because they waste the money even if it's 30% cheaper. Now by comparison, if my architecture costs twice as much, and it can boost sales by 5%. It might still be cheaper, the one that costs more. And what if that architecture could reduce operational expenditures by replacing, say, back-end workers with artificial intelligence? It doesn't matter what it costs as long as the value delivered to the client is greater than its cost. So Simon, that's the key. If a solution's a billion dollars, but it produces $2 billion of business value, it's cheap. If a solution costs $1,000 but doesn't provide any value, it's expensive. So what do we need to look at from the perspective of a cloud architect or an enterprise architect? What is the actual business problem they have? And what is the cost of that problem? You need to know that. For example, I can tell you I worked with a hospital where we found that the average nurse was working an additional two hours per day. And the solution was popping in an ice machine and saving the nurses for walking. But I want you to understand the magnitude. The fully loaded salary of a nurse is roughly $50 an hour in, in that hospital. And if each hospital, if each nurse, and they had about a thousand nurses in the hospital, worked um, a thousand full-time people, worked an extra hour at $50, you know, it's 50, it'd be $50 times 1,000. Now that's a half a million dollars of a problem right then and there. Which could be, which in this case was solved by a five thousand dollar or less ice machine. It was a pretty cheap fix. So we have to understand the problem. We have to understand, you know, the sales costs of a company and what we could do. We have to understand maybe we're creating a solution to improve the customer journey. And if we improve the customer journey, not only the customer not the but the business not lose clients, but that business may gain more. How are ways that we can improve the supply chain for a business? If we can improve the supply chain, which enables them to get products better, faster, and cheaper, they can earn a greater degree of profitability. Or maybe the organization has a shipping company attached, and we can use artificial intelligence to forecast fuel pricing. And by doing so, we might be able to save a billion dollars a year on fuel costs, but the solution might cost $300 million. Believe me, it's a cheap solution for a bigger problem. So that's what we really need to think about, and let's talk about performance.
again, it all goes back to the business. We're not techies. We're not engineers. I'm thankful they have them. Their focus is that stuff. Our focus is what we can do. What performance do we need? Why do we need the performance? Are we designing a trading system where if we can process a trade one nanosecond faster than our competition, it can equate to an additional $50 million a year for which we've got a performance requirement? Are we working on performance because the website, if it's too slow, it doesn't search engine optimize well? And if so, what is the cost of that that we need to worry about? So it's all based upon the problem we actually have to solve. What are the performance needs? We need to figure that out and we need to quantify that by the business. What is the cost of downtime? Is it a million dollars a second or is an hour of downtime cost 50 bucks? If the hour of downtime costs 50 bucks, I'm not going to build any high availability systems in there. It's not, not going to make a, a difference to the client. But if downtime costs $1 million a minute or a second, and I've worked with a lot of businesses where it does, these businesses, or at least a half a million dollars a minute, these businesses need to work very diligently to maintain their systems and their uptime, which provides their performance. So it all goes back to what problem are we solving? That's the real question. If you know what problem you're solving, then you know what to do. And that's why we architects have to have the business acumen to quantify the problem. And then, you know, nobody's going to buy it just because we're like, here, buy our stuff. And we bought them dinners. That helps. But then we need to prove to them that our solution is going to work. So we need to create a return on investment capital model, which, of course, I teach all my students, that shows the customer the value of the solution is much greater than its cost, and then the customer buys. Of course, they negotiate as well, which, of course, we teach these skills. But now I think you're getting the understanding of why architecture training like we provide has nothing to do with certification training which is more aimed at the tech. The engineers focus on the tech and that is their job. And believe me, I love engineers because they take my designs and they make them reality. They're awesome, these engineers. The architect's job is how do we improve the business? And that's why the architect focuses on the business and we have to build a team of smart, talented people to help us design the tech and certain solutions so we can focus on business optimization. And then those really great techie can focus on making the tech thing in the matter that we need it to. Feel free to add here, Alonzo. I, I I can't finish that one, man. <laughs> I think that was an excellent incorporation of, of the differences between cloud architecture and enterprise architecture. Um, but when it comes to enterprise, I, I really liken it to, if anyone understands Jenga, the game where you're stacking a lot of the wood. So, I mean, or the wood pieces. When it comes to that enterprise, you have to be very careful about what is being changed, upgraded, deprecated, because it could affect other teams, other silos, other environments. So you have to understand the overall encompassing enterprise and know how it's moving or rather how it's performing and how it relates to the overall goals of the organization. So if there's some changes, why? That's the overall driving understanding of what the implications are for that department, for that silo, whether it could encompass payroll, security, uh, customer relations, how is that all coming into play and how does the overall uh, chessboard work and how is it going to uh, interplay uh, with interoperability with a lot of the uh, the environments within that uh, within that architecture. So understanding what is happening there is the goal of an enterprise architect and how that uh, how they support uh, the chief information officer and the overall goals, of the CEO. So when you focus on that, it's important that one piece could knock the whole thing out of whack. So understand, get that 10,000 foot view on enterprise architecture, how it all works and how you can improve that environment one section at a time. Paula Shockey again, given that they're both director level positions and likely have similar responsibilities, which is better, the job of director of architecture or director of engineering? See, Falashaki, again, this is going to be subjective. What does the person want to do? Now, if you ask me which one has more career, greater career potential, it'll always be the architecture person, and it's never going to be the engineering person. And it's sad, but let's talk about why. The person managing the architect is more focused on the business. And they're more focused on their client's business. And they're a very customer-facing role. So they're typically going to earn more than the directors of engineering. But it's not just that. You know, when the engineers do their job and they do it well, it's like, okay, you did your job. 
and no, there's really no gratitude for it. It's like, let's say uh, I actually do all the cooking in the house and it's just expected when I cook. It's like, okay, there's dinner here. My cat waits for me my wife waits for me and they all wait for the dinner that I cook. It's expected. And when an engineer, and, and, and likewise, you know, me having laundry in my closet, I'm just thrilled that my wife's real good at it and it comes in and smells real good and it's not usually wrinkly. So I just expect it to be in my closet. Now, if the, if, the, if the clothes aren't in my closet, I actually get upset with the person. If there's no food, my cat's going to look at me like, you have four heads, Mike. So it's expected. And we expect the engineers to do their job. So when they do their job, there's almost no credit. Because that's back-end stuff. And when you do back-end stuff, which is very, very, very important, no, there's, no, there's no gratitude. There's no extra money. There's no how excitement because it's back-end stuff. Now the director of architecture is now dealing with architects. And let's say that architecture team brings in an extra billion dollars that year. Whoa, this person brought in a billion dollars. Oh, congratulations. Here's your bonus. Here's your this. Here's your this. Here's your this. Because at the end of the day, the lifeblood to business is revenue. No revenue comes into business. Everybody gets fired. So the you know the, the people that are bringing in they call them the hunters that are bringing in the money they're not hunting animals and I would and that's not something I have any desire to do either I love my animals but you know they're hunting for money and they're bringing it in so imagine you got a bunch of hungry troops and you bring in a thousand pounds of food imagine the credit and love you're going to get unfortunately the love that you get for doing the work behind the scenes just isn't there so that's me but I like being in front. I like you being given opportunities. And you know, reality is, I like earning more for the same amount of work that I do. It enables me to do things that are charitable and take care of other people and take care of family and sometimes friends. So for me, that's why I prefer these types of jobs because I feel good when I care for others. But again, if you want to be behind the scenes and you're not trying to be in public and on stage constantly because you don't like that, and you're not looking for the glory in the same way. And you don't want to talk with business executives. You'd rather talk and give to techies. Then director of engineering might be better. So the key is you have to do what makes you happy. Look, I went to school for seven years, learned internal medicine. And guess what? Within a year of internal medicine, I went to tech. It's a great job. It's something that's still near and dear to my heart. But I don't want to do that for work. I'll volunteer and take care of some people when they need it. And I'm happy to do that. But I don't want to do it all day, every day. Now, going with a new client, having a new challenge every day, you know, going to a client in Greece, going to a client in Dubai, going to a client in London, going to a client in Nice, going to Brisbane, Australia to go meet a client in Palm Beach. I like that. It's what I enjoy. So we have to do what we enjoy. We have, because if we're not passionate about it, and if we don't like it, we're going to be miserable. And let me tell you, a life of misery just doesn't seem worth living. I know how the game ends. In my, in my time in medicine, I saw the last minutes and the last hours and last days for many people. No one said, I wish I did this job that I hated more so I had more money. They said, I wish I did this. I wish I had a career like yours. I wish I spent more time with my kids. I wish I had a job that I liked. So you have to be happy with what you do. That would be my advice, fellow Shockey. Totally agree. Find your passion. And it doesn't, don't focus on what's difficult. Focus on what you want to do and have the determination, the focus and dedication to get yourself there. And we can help you as a cloud architect. And But if engineering is your goal, seek out those resources understand the coding, understand how it incorporates and how it comes together as you build architecture. So your trajectory is up to you. It's up to you what on what you want to do and how you want to get there. Simon, I know you're a BGP export, expert, but as a cloud architect, how do you respond to BGP related questions without being too technical? It's a good question. Okay, Simon, it's a good question. So let's think about this. So if I was a network architect, and my focus was as a network architect, not a cloud architect, what I'd really be doing is talking to the client. Okay, if, here's our BGP peering points. Let's talk about our options. If we we could take we could take in this community, and we can uh, we can we can manipulate the traffic based upon the community that's sent to us. 
And we could load share across these links by without getting out of our packets by changing the weight, the local preference, the med, what have you. We could leak a more specific subnet on this link versus another another link and put an aggregate route here. We could chop up our organization into five different autonomous systems and run OSPF internally and BGP between them with this BGP routing policy. That's from a network architect. Now, if I'm a cloud architect, here's the reality. If it's a big, big opportunity, I'm going to bring in a network architect with me. I'm going to let them get as geeky as possible. And as soon as it goes to networking, I'm going to say, go there. Now, Simon, if I was focus focusing functionally as the enterprise architect or a lead chief cloud architect, I'd still bring in the network architect, even though that's my old background. And why? I can't focus on everything if I'm just focusing on the network. <laughs> now, it depends on the question. If I'm being with my client and the client's some executives and they're talking about, Mike, I understand there's this routing protocol called BGP. My team says we need it, but I don't understand a word of it. We can say, Simon, let me explain this to you. Here's the reality. Anytime you want to connect to more than one or another service provider or an external organization, you need to exchange routing with them. And the reason you do so is you know how to get your traffic to them. It's kind of like being knowing how to reach multiple highways. And they say, okay, I get it. And we can say, look, there's a lot of tools that we have. BGP gives us things that we can tell her that you don't need to know it. Things like the weight, the local preference, but we can design the architecture where we can send 50% of your traffic on this link, 50% of your traffic on this link. And by doing so, you can use both links and get extra value for the money you've actually paid for these links instead of leaving one active and leaving one standby like you previously used. Now, I might need to talk about that with them. Now, if I've got a chief information officer, I could say, you know, we might get to this level. We might say, you know, cloud security isn't anywhere close to the data center security. But you can't do any of the network micro segmentation you could in the cloud like you could in a data center with multiple VLANs and private VLANs and 802.1x and QoS and other things we can do. So, Simon, if you're since you're the chief information officer, if you want to uh, use the cloud, what we can do is we can divide your system into something called multiple VPCs, which are like private data center, and then we can use BGP to route between them. And there's various BGP policies we could go. And I try not to get that much deep, deeper than that. Now, where I would get a little deeper is when I see the design that's coming in, I would make sure that uh, the traffic is engineered properly and that it'll work in a failover situation. I would do that as an architect. But as an architect, I'm going to try not to get that techie. I'm going to try and bring in some smart engineers and specialty architects to be techie. Because let's say Alonzo is the CEO and I'm the lead architect. I could try to impress Alonzo with my BGP knowledge. I could. Or I could say, or, Al or Alonzo's people can be asking me questions and I could say, you know, for networking, I've got this guy, Mark Malonovich. He's Malikovich. He's an awesome network architect with me. I'm going to have him answer your networking question. Okay, you know what? This guy, Richard LaPasca, on my team, he's really great with security. Why don't you talk to Richard? Which sounds better, Alonzo? Me trying to be everything or me being the coordinator of the experts? Coordination is key. So kind of keep that in the back of your mind. Ahmed, I am grateful to your sessions and find myself lucky to refine your channel. I come from a place that makes it financially impossible to afford your professional programs. I would have bought it all. Ahmed, we do the best we can. We basically, we essentially charge our cost to run these programs. And, you know, what I try to do is take my $300,000 education and drop it down to the cheapest price possible. And that's what we've actually done. We do have a non-live version for people in the developing world. I come from the developing world myself. My family's from Greece, and I know, you know, kiosk prices are just not there. Unfortunately, you know, to maintain a team of three MBAs and two PhD business school professors and network architects and application architects and enterprise architects and other executives, which is what our students demand, there's a cost to that. But stick around for all the free stuff we do. We do a lot of free things. Stick around for any free workshop we can do. And I'm just happy to hear you, Ahmed. Have you here, Ahmed? 
And another great thing, Ahmed, is that um, Ahmed is that look at all of our free content that we have on YouTube. There's a lot for you to explore. There's a lot for you to learn. There are so many things that we give away for free that other people would would charge. So look at our YouTube if you want to learn about BGP. If you want to learn about BGP state machines, internal, external BGP, MPLS, ISPF. If you want to learn about any of these concepts as well as data center or cloud implementation we have a full library of a lot of free content that we've established over the years for you to review so look at that information write down your notes continue to join us and i'm sure that you're going to be able to absorb a lot of this knowledge and hopefully you could join us as well who's out Hello, guys. Nowadays, it is wise to be guided by a passion when it comes to choosing a field in the tech industry. Or so rather, look, out, yeah. look out from my perspective, Mr. Faustino, it is always wise to love your job. So Mark Twain said it about 100 years ago. I think it was 100 years ago. I can't really remember. He said that if you can make your vacation, which to the rest of the world is your holiday, your vocation, which means your job, you'll never work a day in your life. So look how I went to school for seven years. I worked in healthcare. I was a firefighter paramedic for a while. I enjoyed those jobs, but I worked. Then I had my own internal medicine clinic where I worked. And then I went to tech, Luke Kyle, and guess what? The only time I ever worked was those first three months of my career where I was a senior network engineer. And as soon as I switched to being an architect, I don't think I've ever worked a day in my life. In fact, I have to tell you, the, um, every day when I used to wake up, after I'd go to the gym, because you know you got to go to the gym, right? So after I'd go to the gym, I'd say to my wife, I can't believe Cisco pays me to actually do this job. They actually pay me for fun. And we used to laugh about it every single day. So yes, absolutely. It's always wise to be guided by passion. Now, it's wise to be guided by passion with practicality too. And here's what I mean. I wouldn't go to school and get a PhD in English if I lived in America. Because at the end of the day, there'd be no career opportunities for me. But you, if you're practical and you look at the things that you can do and you can figure out which one you like, you'll be there. And, you know, honestly, I have friends that are passionate about anything that are good at it. I have a friend that opened a yoga studio 17 years ago, and he and his wife were more passionate about yoga. I walked in that studio 17 years ago as a big weightlifting dude. And I took that first yoga class and I've been hooked ever since because they were passionate about it. It's a one of my best friends in the world. And obviously he's done well. I have friends that were that loved art and they loved to work with art and they did really well as an artist. But they lived it, they ate it, they breathed it, they slept it. So I think passion is really important. And if I'm going to hire somebody, I'm going to hire somebody passionate. I'm going to hire somebody that wants to be there. I'm not going to hire someone that looks like it's trouble for them to get out of bed and come in. So, yeah, I completely agree with you, Luca. I was thrilled you were here yesterday. I'm thrilled you're here today. I hope you can join us tomorrow in the free webinar on how to get your first cloud job. My team will pop it in the, in the window. It would be awesome to have you back. Fala Shaki, what are some important business terms for architects to know of? Fala Shaki. The less jargon, the less terms you use in your life, the better. I don't use any business terms. I mean, occasionally we'll talk about CAGR or compound annual growth rate. Often we'll talk about free cash flow versus EBITDA versus uh, net income. But it's not the business terms to know. It's the understanding of a business. It's the understanding of saying my business can spend its money here or they can spend its money here. They can only invest it at one, which one's going to provide the greater return on investment. It's the knowledge to understand how business processes are and how to identify inefficient business processes or the way things are done and optimize them. It's about understanding how to align the organization's people with the organization's processes, with the organization's technology to design something that's going to do something for them. It's about being able to look and find patterns of inefficiency. It's to be able to look at a balance sheet, a financial statement, a cash flow statement, and figure out where the opportunity for improvement is. These are business things. 
And it's not a term that you need to understand. You know, in a certification, they teach you a term like S3. You know what I'll never use with my clients? A term like S3. I'll talk about object storage. I don't get involved in the marketing terms or funny abbreviations or jargon. In fact, in our class, we actually are going, we were going to create a swear jar where anytime somebody actually said, uh, easy to, we were going to put like a dollar in there as a, as a little penalty and then donate it all to charity because you can't use these terms with a client. So the key is, uh, I was sent a book from an executive coach of mine about 20 years ago, and the book was entitled Why Business People Speak Like Idiots. And it was about people making up funny terms like world class or, you know, or and using jargon and when in the end they should be using standard business terms. So learn it till you can explain it to a 10 year old. And when you can explain anything to a 10 year old, you know it well enough. And that's how you communicate at a sixth to eighth grade level at all times unless you need to. Now, I don't mean improper grammar like ain't. I'm talking about the reality of being good and knowing how to communicate simply and effectively, like I'm doing with you right now. I'm not spewing any jargon. I mean, I did when I said Kagar and Ibada, but you know, how often do you hear anything like that out of my mouth? And I only used it just to give you an example of a few terms, but I don't really use any technical term, any any jargon. How about you, Alonzo? How, how do you feel about jargon? Uh, blah, blah, blah. You know, that that reminds me of that. And I'm old school. That reminds me of that teacher from Charlie, Charlie Brown. Wah, wah, wah. That's all I hear. So are you relating to your customer? Are you speaking in a way that they understand, in a way that they want to disseminate and understand this information? Are you doing what is best for them instead of how you want to incorporate jargon to possibly make yourself seem intelligent, which will give you the total opposite um, effect. So business terms, I wouldn't put too much stock in them. Understand what they are, like the tech, what they are, what it does, when you would use it. But overall, communicate in a way that's effective to your client and you're going to be in a better space. Mohammed. Is there a first question? Um, I'll just start with this one, Mike. What's uh, what's the best method to follow for these RFQs or RFPs? Um, stack older or chief technical officer? I'm not exactly sure. Okay, so I think I know what Muhammad's there. I think what he's asking is how would you do an RFI, RFP, RFQ? How would you manage stakeholders and how would you communicate to the CTO? Okay. So Muhammad, honestly, it's about an 800-hour answer. It's not something we can do here. And here's the reason why. I'm not going to respond to every RFP the same way. Yep. Maybe it's a small RFP, and I can use AI to mostly respond to it for me. Maybe it's a 400-page long RFP, and I need to go to my executives and build a team of 20 or 30 people. And not only do I need a team of 20 or 30 people, which I need to lead, I need a project manager to make sure that the stuff is delivered by the people on time. And I need a tech writer to harmonize and polish it up in the end. So all these things are, it depends. And, you know, we're not engineers. And I, I want to say this in the most delicate way. Engineering is like baking. You follow a recipe. And we need our engineers to follow a recipe. We avoid errors that way. And they're good at it. We follow intricate processes. But for the things up top where we've got to get creative, we can't work with the same kind of structure. It's kind of like practicing medicine. Somebody comes in with abdominal pain. It could be an abdominal aortic aneurysm. It could be liver failure. It could be a duodenal ulcer. It could be a peptic ulcer. It could be a gastric ulcer. They could have appendicitis. And we have to be able to find what the problem is before we can learn and think about a solution. And that's why architecture and engineering are so different. I almost think in many cases that it's a handicap to have worked with hands-on before you desire architecture. And at the so other time, sometimes hands-on is good because it gives you a little bit of experience. So it's an either or. But these things take, you know, a long time to learn. And, you know, that's why we can't have a 20-hour architect program. We have an 800, almost an 800-hour architect program at this point. So it's not something we can cover this quickly. Neptune. Nowadays, 
uh, recruiters put the title of data architect or solution architect on a job description. But when it comes to the interview, the recruiter hiring manager is requesting to have technical hands on. Well, here's the thing. Neptune Michael, I haven't seen a job description that's ever been accurate in my entire life. <laughs> I have never had more than 10% of the skills in the job description. And you can see some videos where I have, I have the president of an IT recruiting firm on here in which she talks about job descriptions being meaningless. But Michael and Neptune, I want you to really think about what they're asking for. And I'm going to tell you what they're really looking for. They want to know you know something behind the certification. They know that there's almost nothing related to the certification that you've ever, that actually pertains to the job. And that's why they're looking for something. But guess what? It doesn't matter what's in the job description. If people are willing to interview you, they're willing to hire you. So you got to get the interview. So let's talk about what they do care. Because I've asked thousands of hiring managers, recruiters, and executives, what do you want when you hire someone? And they say, I need someone that can do the job and do it well. What you've done in the past doesn't determine if you can do the job and do it well. The next thing they say is I need people I can trust. I got to tell you, of the 6,000 interviews I've done, actually it's over 6,000, 5,950 people have lied to me. The stuff that was on their resume, they couldn't substantiate. Couldn't hire a single one. The next thing they're looking for are people that communicate well. And guess what? If you can do that, you raise the energy in the team, you don't cause team conflicts, and you can get the right information. Can't communicate. They can't hire you. Next, they're looking for people that are energetic, enthusiastic, and passionate about the work. They're looking for people's emotional intelligence. They're looking to see where they're a great team player. They're looking to see your leadership skills. They're looking to see your business acumen. And they're looking to see your presentation skills. And the last part of the interview is going to be a presentation. And that's where all the techies fall apart. And they do that because they're looking to get an executive that also knows tech. So I wouldn't worry about any of that. I'd worry about being great. And, you know, I gave some names earlier today of people that had no experience and no hands-on before they got hired. I'll go through a different batch. Pierre DeSalt was someone that had no hands-on tech. He was working with Lise Webb before we trained him and got we got him hired as a solution architect with Luis, Lise Webb. And Wallace Agana was never a hands-on person. He was a sales rep. We got him hired by J.P. Morgan Chase as an enterprise architect. And, uh, for example, Vladimir, who was 24 years old, college dude, no hands-on tech. We trained him. We got him hired as a solution architect. Noah Parker, guess what? No hands-on experience. He was a social worker. First job was a solution architect. Vladimir was this 24-year-old rock star college student. First job as a solution architect. Al Legister. He, we trained him. His last job was in sales. And the job that we got when he was done our training was a senior solution architect with uh, Deloitte. Balwinder was a stay-at-home mom who we got hired at Microsoft, again, without the hands-on. It's not the hands-on. But I want to make it real clear, Neptune Michael, if you want to get a job at McDonald's, they want two years' experience. If you want to get a job at the front desk of a hotel, they want a couple years' experience. It doesn't matter. Everybody gets their first job and they don't have the experience. So that's not the concern. The things that I tell you are what matters. So don't worry about it. Worry about these things. And uh, you know what? Let's, let's actually talk to you about what, is it, what, uh, what happened with CIO Magazine and the Gartner Group. And here's the reason why. So, you know, we all look at these job descriptions for architect jobs, and we literally laugh. I mean, it's such a joke. A couple of buddies and I, we used to get together on WebEx. We used to drink some good expensive scotch. And we used to actually, for a comedy routine, look at some of arch these cloud architect job descriptions. And we were all cloud architects. And, and none of them, honestly, ever, ever did any of these things that were in these job descriptions. So what actually happened is Gartner, an organization that really analyzes most trending technology, the best technology, at least in terms of leader leadership, companies, what they want, what they don't want, actually started and asked. The uh, chief information officers of all these companies, what do you want in your cloud architects? And in case you didn't know, you got the CEO, like me, who sets the strategy for the organization. Let's say Alonzo was my chief information officer. He'd be aligning the technology for my, to, for my strategy. And then he would hire all the technology people on my team. So when, they, when Gartner asked, you know, 
the CIOs, what do you want in a cloud architect? They said they want someone that can lead the cultural change for cloud adoption, someone that can develop and coordinate a cloud architecture, someone that can develop a cloud strategy and coordinate the adoption process, someone to help find talent with the necessary skills, someone that can assess applications, software, and hard work, someone who can create a cloud broker team, someone who can establish best practices of the cloud across the company, someone that could help select cloud providers and vet third-party services, Someone that help could see oversee governance and mitigate risk, working with the IT security people to monitor privacy and develop incident response procedures, manage budgets and estimate costs and operate at scale. So you can see, and these are the things we train in more in our program, is there. Now, Michael Neptune, I'm going to tell you when you get this job as an architect, if you work for AWS or Azure or Google or Cisco or IBM, Accenture, Deloitte, KPMG, Capgemini, you're not going to be allowed to touch the, the customer's technology. I mean, not allowed at all. That's done by another team. So you can still get hired. You don't need to worry about it. You just got to be great. Full of shocking. If a cloud architect is working on a small project and they're the only architect, how can they, for example, enlist the help of a network architect? Okay, Alonzo, you're a network architect. Hey, Alonzo, how are you today? I called him. Hey, it's Mike. I'm working as a cloud architect. I'm working on this mini project, but I need somebody to go uh, evaluate something. Could you go look at something for 15 and then drinks are on me tonight? Absolutely. See you there. Done. That's why it's all about your emotional intelligence, your communication skills, your sales skills. You can't know everything. Mm -hmm. You know what? I've been in networking now since 1996. I worked with the ISDN cloud, the Frame Relay cloud, the ATM cloud, the BGP cloud, the VPLS cloud, and now these new clouds. Do you know what? I'm a CCIA back when it was the harder two-day exam, and uh, my number is 7417. I've got Mark on my team who's also a CCIA. I know BGP, I know OSPF, and I team my new IP multicast solutions. Mark knows software-defined networking and SASing and all those solutions in depth. You got another CCI that only knows wireless. And you got another CCI that only knows voice, all in just Cisco. And they would have to ask each other because you can't know everything. The key is to find what you love, develop a passion for it, an energy and enthusiasm and edge, and develop a laser-like focus and be good at it. So you're only as good as your team. There's an African proverb that says, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. Build your team. Build your relationships. And even though I'm a remote work from home person for the last 20 years, I still go to the office. I don't do it every day. I might only even do it once a week, but I do it. And here's the reason why. I go to the office. I talk to some people. I kiss some babies. I have some drinks with somebody that night. I don't drink that much except for when I'm at work. And, you know, I might have lunch with somebody. I'll go just hang out and develop those relationships so I can do it. So kind of keep in mind, this is a relationship business. And this is a bit, and the, the higher you go up in the business world, the more people follow up, the more responsible they are, the more responsive they are to you, and the more favors you go, they've, you've given them and they, they owe you back. Because it's a world of helping, helping, and helping. And you can almost look at it as a, a great football team, whether that be American football or European football or the rest, or I should say football for the rest of the world. The team. It's not about one person. It's about the whole team. And the better they know each other, the better they care each other, the better the outcomes. You want to add to this, Alonzo? <laughs> Couldn't have said it better. Now, think about it again. Um, and this also, and it, this, this stems back to a lot of questions that we've had about people wanting to start their own business. You're one architect. You're only a facet of what an environment needs. Networking, security, generalists. Uh, the list goes on. Big data, warehousing. I mean, we've got people. There's so I, I can't even name them all, can we, Mike? About no. you, you can't learn them all. So this is where where your business skills come in, which we teach, which a lot of providers don't do, is that we focus on you building those relationships so that you can, just like that scenario Mike laid out for you, um, how you can build these relationships, get the top tier people on your team to facilitate success. The more you do, the more you're known for. And the more you're known for, the more you're going to get those opportunities, those resources. Your name will pop up 
in high echelons of circles and it's going to bring your brand upwards and outwards so when you think about these uh particular businesses that you seek to work for you're never going to be the only one focus on your competency be the best cloud architect journalist be the best cloud security architect networking and so forth continue to contribute offer ideas continue to drive home success be able to bring those along with you mentorship and so forth and everything will will come out in a way that you won't believe absolutely and if you've got questions ask them because uh, alonzo and i really want to help answer them neptune a solution architect or a cloud architect which one has better career opportunities mike take that one away please <laughs> neptune by far a cloud architect so i really want to tell you who hires solutions architect amazon hires solutions architect microsoft hires solutions architect google hires solutions architect here's all the solutions architect is you're trained in one vendor and you design present and sell a single vendor solution now, Neptune Michael, 98% of organizations are multi-cloud, which means in those other 98% of the organizations, you can't work as a solution architect. They need people that understand it all. Let's say now you're going into a cloud architect. So I would always be a cloud architect. Now, with the cloud architects we train, many of them get jobs as solutions architects. And a solution architect is really someone that works for the vendor that actually designs it. The cloud architect is, you know, further abstracted, except at Amazon, because they've got a funny role for the cloud architect. But for the rest of the world, the cloud architect sits between, say, an enterprise architect and a solution architect. And then they might bring an AWS solution architect to consult them for AWS, an Azure solutions architect to consult for, for Azure, a Cisco solutions architect to come in and help with the networking, a Palo Alto solutions architect to come in with some security things. So a cloud architect has many more options. That's why we always trained our people for cloud architects. And here's the other thing I want you to think about Neptune. A cloud architect like me or a cloud architect like Alonzo, we can work anywhere. So a lot of these organizations have moved to the cloud and they found that on average it costs two and a half times more to run their workloads in the cloud than it actually did in the data center. So a lot of people are moving their stuff from the cloud back to the data center, but the cloud is really awesome, right? So people like me will just bring in a Nutanix cloud solution to the data center or an OpenStack software into the data center and turn that data center into a cloud and allow virtual machines to spin up and spin down, enable all that serverless function as a service type stuff that actually still sits on servers. And we can add capacity as we need. And in that private cloud, if we're getting near a near full capacity or we need more, we can just add capacity on demand on AWS, Azure, and Google all at the same time. We could put 80% of our workloads in the data center that need the most power, performance, best security, speed, which also has the lowest cost. And we could put that super big scalability stuff in the cloud. So cloud architect can work anywhere. Solution architect can work for three to five companies in the world, and that's it. So I'd rather become a cloud architect. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Let's equate it to cooking. I'm, I'm a big foodie. Okay. So um, solution architect, I only know how to make pastries. I only know how to do that versus a cloud architect. I know how to make pastries. I know how to make steak, beef Wellington, baked Alaska. I know how to make anything that you want to know under the sun because I know how it drives success. So you see the differences. And also, Neptune, if you start focusing on a particular cloud service provider being an AWS solutions architect, Azure solutions architect, and Google Cloud professional um, uh, solutions architect, you're going to be out of step with the industry because 98% of organizations are multi-cloud implementers, okay? And then number two, you're also going to pigeonhole yourself into only knowing one technology. As technology moves forward, we're seeing a lot of shifts in who's taking the top spot in being the top cloud service provider, and it's not going to be AWS, okay? So if you focus on one particular uh, scenario, you're going to be out of step with that. And also, you're going to limit your job opportunities. So look at the cloud architecture position. Full, look at the agnostics. Look at the options outside of cloud service providers, how it reflects the needs of the business, what they need to do, what they need to do to be optimal in their approach, uh, efficient in their approach, cost effective in their approach, and look at it from that perspective. So the more you know, the more you get paid and the better career opportunities. Yes, and we'll end with this. Uh... 
you know, a perspective of whether AWS is not the winning or losing cloud is Alonzo's perspective, not necessarily the perspective of this company or, a, or an investment recommendation. Having said that, if you look at what's going on with Azure, if you look at what's going on with Azure's installed base and Azure's experience with digital transformation and the fact that Azure or, or Microsoft earned seven times more than all of AWS's business did last year combined, it, it, there are many people right now that are, that are that I saw an article today where people are saying that. So, you know, that's just in a perspective. It's just an opinion. It's not investment advice by any stretch. Oh, of right. <laughs> no, definitely not. <laughs> definitely not. But, uh, but I, I, I don't think we've seen the end of who's going to be the king and queen of the count cloud yet. I think it's going to be, we're going to see a lot more soon. Yeah. Especially with the AI and what's going on out there. Totally with that. That's definitely an X, that, that X factor in there. Diggleman, hi Mike. What is the best way to show leadership skills to your superiors? I like that question as well. It's a great question. How you carry yourself, how you respond to stress, how you treat others in the room. Do you bring out the best in others? You're a good leader. Are you uh, creating a hostile environment? Are you creating a welcoming environment? Are you moving roadblocks out of people's way? How smooth are your interactions with people? These are the ways you're going to show your leadership. Are people willing to follow you around? How likable are you? What do your relations look like? Relationships, that's what people are going to be looking at. You know, you, sometimes you can go to a country club and you can see the person that's got 30 people following them around. Chances are they're pretty well liked or else they're super rich and everybody wants their money. It's one of those two things. But... When you find somebody that's got that's not super rich and everybody's following them around, it's because they're a really good leader. We've all had really good leaders. We've all seen it and we've all felt it. You know, the leader is someone that's really good. You don't want to disappoint them because you, you want to show them you can do better. And we've all had leaders where we don't care what they think. That's because they're a bad leader. So I try to look at that. Who will people follow? What is the brand that someone has? Kind of keep that in the back of your mind. Alonzo, please add your perspective. Oh, agreed. Leadership, that is a facet of your brand, Diggleman. Think about this, is that <clears throat> people want, they are attracted to who they respect, who they want to learn from, and who they want to actually be. So when it comes to uh, showing leadership, emotional intelligence is a big key. So we're always going to be involved with organizations and people in them that may not subscribe to how you attack problems, how you interact with customers, uh, team leaders, as, especially in the moments where things are stressful and they may not be able to handle it as well as you or other members of the team. So this would be an opportunity to showcase your skills, encourage, support, mentorship, and being able to not only address problems as you see them, but provide solutions behind them so that you can be known as a solution provider instead of a, a, a critiquer without any uh, possible um, opportunity for success. Yoshida, in my current project and organization, I would be working on migrating on-premise data to AWS data-led projects. Would it be helpful or not in terms of switching careers to AWS from being a Java developer? Yoshida, let's make this clear. There is no AWS career. AWS is just somebody else's data center where they're hosting applications and servers. So, right, if you do a project as a Java developer on AWS, you'll be a Java developer, the same Java developer that you've always been, but instead of hosting your virtual machines, for example, or big data in your data center, you're going to host them on the cloud. So none of that matters. Now, if you want a career in the cloud, you have to determine what that career is. Do you want to be an architect? Then learn the business skills, the leadership skills, the sales skills, the executive presence, the emotional intelligence, the CXO relevancy, and then develop your network data center and cloud skills. If you want to be a Java developer on the cloud, guess what? You'll be the same Java developer you always have, but instead of posting it on the data center, you host it on the cloud. Maybe you want to be a big data person, like a data scientist. Then what you'll do is you'll you'll do your project on the cloud, and then you would learn the data science tools. You'd learn machine learning. You'd learn Python. You'd learn R. You'd learn machine learning libraries like PyTorch and TensorFlow. 
You would learn whether to compute on a GPU versus a TPU versus a CPU. You would learn how to do your modeling, et cetera. So Amazon is just somebody else's network in a data center. That's all it is. So all the same careers that exist off the cloud are the same careers that end up on the cloud. So you see, what goal, what goal career would you like? And then I can tell you the skills that you would need to get there, and I'd be honored to do so. But AWS isn't a career. AWS is just a company that rents you data center services. So you can think of AWS as a restaurant. That's all it is. And that restaurant has the executive chef. It's got a CEO. It's got the receptionist or the hostess. It's got the food servers. It's got the bartenders maybe. And it's got uh, people that clean up the tables. I'm sure there's more that goes in there. My family owned the Greek Donner, so it wasn't exactly a fancy place. It was a great place. You know, We had cooks, we had dishwashers, we had cashiers, and we had waiters and waitresses. But you know, the point is, is all these things are, are all roles that would exist in a restaurant. And all the same roles are on the cloud. Software developers, cloud engineers, DevOps engineers, <laughs> network architects, cloud architects, cloud security architects. AI architects, data scientists, it's all the same jobs. So it's a great place to do your next project, but what goals do you have? Then we can figure out how to get you to career because otherwise it's just like you had dinner at one restaurant versus another, nothing changed. Simon, when a cloud architect collaborates with a project manager, how can they reduce friction in their collaboration? People okay, before I get to this, if you guys have questions, please ask them. Otherwise, Alonzo and I are super busy people and we will get back to work. But if you've got questions, we want to help you. So when a cloud architect collaborates with a pro project manager, there should, should be no friction in their thing. So if your emotional intelligence is there and your communication skills are there and you follow up and do what you're supposed to, there should be no friction. I've never had any friction with a project manager in my entire life. Alonzo, not only are you a great cloud architect, but you've also been a project manager. For the people that actually did their jobs and communicated well and were emotionally intelligent to follow up, did you ever have any friction? No, not at all, not at all. And even if there were some um, inconsistencies, it's up to you to be diplomatic, be able to apply the right communication skills and effectiveness to motivate them to do what's right, to make sure you're on time, under budget and and everything else to keep the stakeholders happy. So Simon, it goes right back to what we've already explained a couple of questions ago about um, emotional intelligence, CXO relevancy, soft skills, um, being able to read the room, understand, and there's a lot of in project and program management called risk mitigation as well as in architecture as well, and being able to get ahead of the problems. There may be some stress going on with the project manager you don't know anything about, pull them to the side, ask how you can help. There could be some issues out uh, that's not even dealing with them. There could be people who have walked off the program, um, leaving them short, uh, short change. Being able to help assist with the problems that they have will mitigate those frictions, uh, that, that friction or, or any potential friction, be able to build some allies and some relationships along the way. So understanding the relationships, but also seeing ahead of it, much like a cloud architect or an enterprise architect, get the understand lay of the land, find out if there's any issues that could happen ahead of time and be able to provide some solutions so that there might not be any problems or overall friction. What about you, Mike? Um, actually, I, I went first, so I think that's great. Uh, yeah, that's true. <laughs> yes, you did. Simon, how can you effectively remember the names, roles, and current tasks of your team members and clients in a professional settings? You write it down. Yeah. <laughs> so there's absolutely no way I can remember everything. Now, if it's a project, there's typically project manager tools whether it be Microsoft Project, whether they be tools like Asana's. But if you're really being an architect, the first thing you do is you ask the executives about their business if you have that opportunity. And then you create an organizational chart. <laughs> because long before you can figure out who, who the people in the processing that technology are and the process you really need to engineer, you need to build yourself an organizational chart. You need to know who the players are, the game are. Because you can't approach the CEO the same way you could approach a CFO 
you know, they care about different things. And the chief technology officer cares about different things than the CEO as well. And the department head of this department cares about different things and they need to be approached completely differently. So you have to figure that out. And then, uh, you know, when can you communicate to people, you talk to them in name, like, hi, Alonzo. After I call Alonzo, Alonzo, 50, 60, 75 times, I'm going to remember his name is Alonzo. And truth be told, when you go to dinner to someone or you entertain clients, you're going to learn them. But, you know, I'm a guy that's got an over overloaded memory at all times. You know, I get three, four, 5,000 messages a day. So I'm always like a little bit behind and overwhelmed. So I cheat. I take notes. And that's really the secret. Keep good. I create a folder on my computer for everything, every project I work on. I've got org charts in there. I've got contact lists in there. I've got business process maps in there. I've got the organization's current technology and assessments, future technology states, architectural documents, RFP response, you name it, it's all there. So you gotta be a little organized for this role because otherwise you're gonna be in, you're gonna be all over the place. <laughs> I mean, you know, my youth. Um, you know, I had one client, it was easy. It really was. To remember their name and then i started working with a dozen clients at the same time consult to this hospital while you're presenting to this hospital while you're consulting to this healthcare organization while you're consulting to this country's government and now you've got people in like the four corners of the world and there's lots of names so write it down and i think another thing that's important is that because we have such a global community of um of team members try to understand before you meet them how to pronounce their names make sure that you understand if there's any meeting or cultural relatively to that so that you can apply it um, in your possible um, documentation or spreadsheet before you get a chance to meet them um, so i think that will go a long way with introductions as well so there's everything is a science everything is relatable to who we are as cloud architects building your brand, building your relationships and understanding how everything comes into play um, throughout the architectural process. Back to Picard. I work on bare metal and hypervisor solutions in my organization, basically private cloud. So Mike, how do I plan my career path to completely switch to the public cloud? I was hired as a solutions architect. However, career path is stuck with private cloud portfolio. I currently hold just basic work experience on the public cloud. Okay, Prakar. So I'm going to ask you some questions and please respond in the chat box. What are you really doing in your job? You said working with hypervisor solutions. Are you the person designing the Nutanix, a Nutanix stack or designing an open stack cloud? or designing a VMware vSphere cloud? Are you that system designer? And if you are, it's one pathway. Or are you really more of an engineer despite the architect title where you're working with these systems, you're adding the systems to say a vSphere, you get hands-on in these systems. Are you working with the, um, the next question I have is, are you working with the networking part of it? Are you working with the security part of it as a design as well as the hypervisor? Are you working with the storage area networks where you're designing these systems, again, like an architect, or are your hands on it? Because here's the reality. The private cloud and the public cloud are identical. It's the same thing. But when people struggle, it's typically because they're hands on in their past job and they need to be more of a system designer. So, Prakar, I'm going to ask you this. Please get back to me on the designer. Do you understand, are you the guy or girl, but and by your name, I think guy, but are you the person that's behind the scenes designing it? Are you calculating the number of CPU cores that we're going to need to be added to the computing pool? Are you thinking about the DRAM? Are you planning the performance of that storage area network? Are you thinking about the physical load balancers that are coming in, or are you working on the virtual load balancers? Have you, are you getting involved in the routers and switches in that data center? Or are you getting involved in just, say, virtual networking inside of the system? So that's really the key. So if you're the system designer right now, good news. You already know all the public cloud, and nobody cares about your experience on the cloud. 
because the virtual machine is the same virtual machine, whether it's VMware, VMware, KVM, QEMU, AWS, Nitro Hypervisor, uh, Azure Virtual Machine, or Google Compute Engine instance, only the names have changed. And if you're designing these systems right now, not doing them, but designing them, the same block storage, object storage, and file storage you have in the data center is the same in the cloud. If you're dealing in the, cl in, in the private cloud, the same network load balancers, application load balancers, and reverse proxies are the same things you're going to use in the cloud. If you're working in a private cloud and you're dealing with the demilitarized zone, the set, well, the next generation firewalls, IDS, IPS, and VPN concentrators, you're going to be using them on the cloud because you're not going to be using the cloud provider's tools anyway. So it's really the same job. Now, if you're trying to go, if you're on the engineering side of this with the solution architect title where you're touching the technology and you want to go to the uh, public cloud, then you're going to have to learn the funny new names of these services and you're going to get a, have to get hands on. If you're going from engineering to architecture, and please come to our free webinar tomorrow, but if you're going from engineering right now, hands-on engineering, and you want to go to solution architecture in the cloud, you're going to have to get trained in an entirely new set of skills. You're going to have to get trained in business acumen because your world will then be, how do you optimize your client's business performance? And if you don't know business, you can't do that. You'll have to be trained in business process re-engineering because part of what we do as good architects is not only find the company's strategy, but help re-architect the business processes. Because if we know how we want the business to operate, then we can think of the right technology. If we think about the technology first, there's a 70% chance we're going to actually hurt the business. And you can see that by failures of cloud projects and McKinsey's data, or technology projects and McKinsey's data. If you're giving presentations to the board of your organization right now, or the board of your customers as a CEO, you're good. And if you're not, you're going to have to learn how to do that to get a solution architect job or a cloud architect job where you're going to be designing, presenting, and selling customer solutions. How good are your presentation skills if you want to be an architect? If they're not good, you're going to have to get trained in it because you're going to be building presentations every day. By comparison, you're going to be responding to RFIs, RFPs, RFQs. Are you used to that? Do you know how to respond to these proposals? If not, you're going to need some training on it. It's no big deal. You can get the training. Are you used to selling? Are you selling clients? If not, you need training like the kind we provide to get you there. How's your negotiation skills? Are you able to negotiate with business executives and close the deal and build the relationship at the same time? If you can, you're great. If not, you're going to learn these skills. But that's why I wanted to know what job you wanted. Because now if you wanted to be an engineer on the cloud, it's going to be all the new names of this stuff. And engineers will learn to code. They'll need Python. They'll need Bash shell scripting. They'll need Linux skills. But and architects won't need any of those skills. They're going to need those business skills. So where do you want to go? I want to help you. Where do you want to go? What's your ultimate destination? You give me that destination, and I can figure out how to get there. But there really is no career path. The career path is this. Train for the job you want and get it. I mean, that's it. Most of my students' first job is as a solution architect. The doctor's first job is a doctor, or an airplane pilot's first job is an airplane pilot. It's not like you go work as an airplane mechanic for a couple of years and then be a and then you know spend the next five years working as a flight attendant and then poof you got to become an airplane mechanic you could be that airplane mechanic then you're going to need to go to a separate school to be a flight attendant you're going to need a separate set of school to learn how to fly the plane afterwards and you're going to need licenses for each thing so let me know i really want to help you polo shocking in consultancies as an architect how would you recommend getting involved with the bigger projects and clients? Ask for them. They, this is one of those things in life where you got to ask your manager. But here's the thing, Phyllis Shockey. Typically speaking, you're going to be in team meetings. And in that team meeting, if, if it's on Zoom or if it's on WebEx or Teams, here's what you're going to see. You're going to see 20 people in the meeting, and half of the people's cameras are shut off, and they're hiding. And the manager will talk about an upcoming project. And they're going to talk about who's interested. And everybody's going to turn that, put their heads down, look busy on their phone if the cameras aren't off. And you say, I'm interested. You'll go volunteer for the biggest stuff and you'll get them. Ask. Ask. You'd be surprised how many people don't ask their manager. I'd like to move up in the company. What skills do you think I should need? What should I work on? And then they just fly blind. Five years later, they don't get promoted. And they quit. And they blame their manager. They didn't ask. They don't know what their manager wants. 
So you got to ask for it. So that's how you do these things. You ask. I do. I ask. I've asked. I ask a lot of questions. Because if I don't ask questions, I don't know somebody's goals. And if I don't know somebody's goals, how do I know how to help them? And that's the thing to remember. They're looking for people that can help them the most. How do they know who's willing to help? You gotta go after it. Go ask them. Go tell them. Make it clear. I want bigger stuff, bigger projects, more responsibility, harder work. You get there. Simon. How can a cloud architect create a proof of concept to demonstrate that their idea can increase revenue and efficiency for the organization? Simon, your proof of concept can't demonstrate that at all. Your proof of concept only proves that the technology works. And that's why I bring in a bunch of engineers to do the proof of concept. Your business acumen will help you demonstrate the business value. How do you examine the problems the organization has? What does the financial statement tell you? What does the balance sheet tell you? What is the CEO telling you? What are the company's customers saying about the organization? What are the employees saying about their difficulties and their pain points? That's the information you need, and that's the quantity thing you have to quantify. I'll give you a basic example. In healthcare, nurses spend 25% of their time looking for equipment. 25% of their time looking for stuff. I mean, it's crazy. So I want you to think about this. The average nursing salary is about $50 an hour. So eight hours a day costs the hospital $400 per nurse. So if two hours of those eight hours is looking for stuff, that's $100. Now, if that hospital has 1,000 nurses times 100 nurses, that's $100,000 just for that. Now then, what if the solution is RFID tags? And RFID tags, when you do your design and your proof of concept, cost $30,000. But you know it cost them $100. That's how you do it. So that's why, you know, that's why I'm not fond of these certifications like the Azure Solutions Architect Expert or the AWS Solutions Architect Professional, the Google Personal Cloud Architect. It's not that they're bad certifications. But that's the skill you need, which is one of the skills that we teach. That doesn't come from a certification. That either comes from getting an MBA like Alonzo and me, Chris, you know, spent hundreds of thousands of dollars on. Or it comes from learning like from people like us that will teach it to you. You're not born knowing that. You're not born knowing how to re-architect the business process. You're not born knowing how to what it quantify a business problem. You're not born knowing how to calculate the expected value of an opportunity, but you have to be taught. And you know, some things you can figure out on yourself. Somehow, I don't know how I was redoing my kitchen and I bought this ridiculously overpriced double induction oven because I wanted to be able to cook quickly because I have no time and it boils wood. I'm like, I mean, it is really cool. But, you know, it didn't have a manual or else it had a manual and I couldn't find it. I could figure it out because it was just which buttons to push until something worked. By comparison, I couldn't learn how to practice medicine by going hands on and learning on the job. I had to know first normal anatomy. Then I had needed to know physiology. Then I needed to know hematology. Then I needed to understand the way the cardiovascular system worked, the pulmonary system worked musculoskeletal work because I needed to know normal. Then I could le learn about abnormal, which was disease, and then I could learn how to treat it. An architect and a doctor, it's the same job. The cost, so that either end, you've got somebody that's got a problem, you got to collect information, and as you collect that information, it brings you to your diagnosis of the problems that you can fix. And then you think about what your plan is, whether it's a prescription, whether it's an architecture, but in either case, to get to that diagnostic level, you've got to learn all the systems, how those systems work. And they be the business systems, they be the people systems, they be the technology systems and all the technology opportunities that you have to optimize that business. It's a great question, Simon, and I hope I answered your question. If not, please feel free to ask another. Bolashaki, is it safe to say open source technologies are superior to their vendor specific equivalent? For example, Apache Kafka over AWS uh, uh, SQS Simple Q service and Azure service um, business and Mongo BS and MongoDB over DynamoDB or Cosmos DB? Well, I think there's two questions here. If you don't want to get locked into a single cloud because your organization and not your organizations are multi cloud, then you can't use any of the proprietary things. Just throw them away. Now, if you've got a business that's only in a single cloud that doesn't have those high availability needs, 
then you could potentially put them on a cloud proprietary thing like SQS or DynamoDB. But here's what I really want you to think about. Who has more experience building a database? MongoDB, which has contributors from people all over the world, or just Amazon and their database? Who do you think is going to provide a better database to run in three clouds? Oracle, who's been providing database solutions for over 30 years, that is the most commonly used enterprise relational database in the entire world, or Amazon, who didn't even exist until 15 years ago. And in the, in the 15 years, they decided they're going to create their virtual network, their virtual data center, and their, their databases and everything else. I'm going to get a, almost like a far better database out of Oracle. I'm also going to have the opportunity to go to a security vendor for my firewall. And what I can get from Palo Alto, who's been in security, or Checkpoint, who's been in security for 30 years now, 25, 30 years, or Cisco, who's been in security for 20, 30 years, is going to be a superior next generation firewall than an AWS WAF, which isn't next generation and doesn't have intrusion detection built in anyway. So it's not that the pro cloud provider stuff isn't good. It's great. But it's like a Swiss Army knife. They make everything, right? Now, if you've ever had a Swiss Army knife, you know that the screwdriver on it's not too good. The bottle opener on it's not too good. The knife on it isn't exactly the sharpest thing. You're not going to be using it to chop down a tree. The scissors on it, the little thing that you might be able to cut a piece of paper isn't going to cut anything serious. It's a Swiss Army knife. Now, if you can go buy yourself a really good knife, it's a knife. If you buy yourself a really good screwdriver, like from Snap-on, it's a really good screwdriver. My brother gave me this snap-on screwdriver. Boy, this thing's cool. The only thing I know how to use is tighten my kitchen cabinets. I'm not good with screwdrivers, but this thing feels really good in your hand. So the flashlight that I bought from Surefire is going to be better than the thing that I bought from, you know, the company that makes 80,000 products. So in most cases, it's probably better to use a system that will work in most environments, but not always. It's all dependent upon what the organization's business needs are. So for me, I will never have a technology solution planned until I actually understand the problem. Never. So I don't have a preferred technology. Now, there are people that work as what's called evangelists. Run away from them. Seriously, run away. Here's what an evangelist is. Here, this is the best thing for you. This is the best thing for you. This is the best thing for you. I get 50 crazy people writing me an email each day about why I need their stuff without knowing anything about me. I delete 100% of those messages. Why? Because they already think I have a problem that I don't have. And without knowing what problem they have, if they give me a solution, it's most likely going to hurt me. At the same time, I have people reaching out to me that says, look, we've got this level of experience and we've had this many clients. We'd love to learn more about your situation so we could see what we could talk about with you. Potentially, we have some opportunities for you. That's a person I'm going to call back because they haven't made their decision. So I want you to always think about this. Architecture and medicine, it's the identical job. If you walked into a doctor and as soon as you walked in, they only had medications from Merck. And the only thing they would recommend was Merck because they bought stock in Merck. Would you want that doctor? Or would you want the doctor that would prescribe any medication regardless of the vendor so they could provide you the best medication for your unique specific condition? That's who I'm going to. I don't want anybody that's bought and sold by a drug company or because they own stock on something or because they're an advocate for just this company. I want the best for my client. And what's the best for my client? Whatever solves very unique problem best. And sometimes it is DynamoDB. Sometimes it's MongoDB. Sometimes it's Apache Cassandra. Usually, it's probably going to be Apache Kafka over an SQS. Usually, but not always. What's your customer? What's their capabilities? What are their needs? You know, all, we have to answer all these things first. It's a good question. For architects, how does public sector, i.e. government, work compared to private sector work? Well, all in all, when you work in public spectre, sector, you can expect to be paid a whole lot less. But it's also an easier work day in many cases. And there's typically less demands placed on you and less uh, things. So it's all what you want to do. You know, if you find enjoyment working with the government, great, go do it. If you find enjoyment helping private enterprise, great, go do it. The key is, what do you like to do? 
And, you know, Chris on my team, you know, is a really critical part of our company. He's a data guy. He's an analytics guy. He likes looking at the data. He finds trends and patterns, and he's really good at it. But he's an analytical personality type. I'm a visionary personality type. I got ideas and plans and this. You put the numbers in front of me, I get a headache. Alonzo gets a headache too. He's more of a visionary type like me. I've got this chief technology officer, Mark. This guy's very process oriented. What do I do first? What do I do second? What do I do third? He needs to see a process. We're a little different. So I'm comfortable jumping on an airplane and you know flying to Dubai and then when you get to Dubai to meet with one client, hey, Mike, while you're here, can you give 50 other presentations? Sure. And when they're there, they'll say, Mike, would you go to Qatar? Why not? I'm already here. Yeah. Hey, Mike, when you're here, go to Egypt. And it's like, oh, very cool. I can go to Alexandria. That's always a place that's kind of fun. It reminds me a little bit of Greece. Poof, go there. And I'm happy to live at this fly-by-night, just go there. Not fly-by-night, uh, just, just go, adapt, improvise, and overcome, because that's my personality but you can't put a functional person in that position. So you gotta find what people like, what they like in their work. I prefer to work in private sector. I, I also prefer the rewards of private sector, but that's me and my personality. You gotta be true to you and you gotta do what you like. It's so important. Yeah, don't, don't follow what other people are doing. Do what you like to do and how, and because there's nothing you know, there's so many people that we can talk about that, um, from my personal experience, they make a lot of money or have made a lot of money, but they were unhappy in their position. So um, it doesn't matter how much you, you want to make is if you're not happy. So focus on your passion and let that lead the way towards how much money you want to make or where you want to work. Yeah, and that's the key. I spent some time working on Wall Street. I much preferred living in Palm Beach than being working on Wall Street. So I chose to live in Palm Beach. It was a lot better for me. Might not have been as good a work opportunity, but it made me happy. Kevin, is it okay to be an in, a cloud engineer for now and then go to become architect at a later time? Absolutely. But, you know, Kevin, I bet you it would take you a lot longer for you because I know you to get a cloud engineering job than it would be an architect. I think you're 60% of the way there with architect skills. And I think you'd have to start from zero to get the engineering skills. You'd have to learn to code. You'd have to learn Terraform. You'd have to learn Linux. You'd have to learn Python. You'd have to learn DevOps. And I think that would take you in a year to 18 months just to learn that. So I think it'll be harder for you to be an engineer before you become an architect. But if it makes you happy, yeah, there's no rules. There's nothing that says you have to be an engineer before an architect. You've seen our graduates, Kevin, you know them, you watch them get hired all the time. You've seen me have engineers that are that it took me a year to retrain to be an architect just as if they had no experience. Not because they weren't great. They were awesome and they were some of the most technical people out there. But because they went from a tech-focused job to a business-focused job, it's a completely new set of skills. So Kevin, the key is what's gonna make you happy? What do you wanna do in the short term and the midterm? That's what really matters. If I wanted to be a cloud engineer, Kevin, I'm going to tell you right now, it would take me 12 months to be able to get a cloud engineering job. I could get a distinguished architect job in 12, and probably in 12 minutes by calling some of the executives that I know. But why is that? Because I've got a name and a brand and a reputation for being an architect, and I've done it. That's what I know how to do. I haven't been an engineer in 25 years. And that would mean for me, Kevin, I have to learn completely how to be an engineer from scratch. Unless it's network engineering, I, I, it would be new to me. I don't code because I'm an architect, but I'd have to learn to code if I wanted to be an engineer. You're not going to see me write a Terraform script, but if I wanted to be a cloud engineer, I would learn Terraform and learn how to write a Terraform script. If you see me write a Python script, it's because I owe money to the mob. And I don't borrow money, borrow money from the mob, but that would be the only way you'd ever catch me programming because I hate it. But... Some people love it. But, you know, in my youth, I would do 700-pound deadlifts because I think it was fun. Other people saw the weight that I would lift, and they're like, Mike, that looks like torture, and they'd go eat cookies. And to me, eating cookies would be torture because that's not what I like to do. Lifting heavy objects was what I used to like to do. So, of course you can, Leo, Mark. Of course you can, Kevin. Sorry. Uh, you'll definitely be fine. 
whatever you do, but of course you can. Here's the real key. Please put 100% focus into whatever it is and master it. And if you want to be an engineer, go be the best engineer out there and keep those same soft skills, that same sales skills, same executive presence, CXO relevancy, emotional intelligence, and you'll quickly rise to the ranks of a distinguished engineer or a principal engineer. Quickly. You want to focus on those business skills, those sales skills, and system design skills, and you'll have a great architecture career. And both are really great. Both are terrific. The key is uh, what you want to do. And that's it. Okay, I believe this may be our last question, Mike. So, from Folashaki again, even if working remotely, is uh, is how an architect dresses and uh, dress important uh, when speaking to C uh, C suite executives? Yes, one hundred percent. Yes, I wear a suit when I go meet with a client, and I wear a suit if I meet with them virtually. Now, Folashaki, I'll tell you the secret. I might only wear my jacket, my shirt, and potentially a tie, and I could be wearing shorts <laughs> under the suit. <laughs> if I'm not going to get up during the meeting and I'm on a remote. But in real life, I wear that full suit, suit and my shoes are polished and my belt is polished. Absolutely. So, Fala Shaki, what if I give you some scary statistics? And these are incredibly scary statistics. 55% of what you look like when you say something is, is communication. 38% of what you sound like is related to your communication. And 7% is your actual content. Well, what? And these are Harvard's numbers, not mine. And every business school has been teaching them for the last like 30 years. Only 7% of what people hear is your content. 55% is what you look like. So stand tall, don't hunch over. Dress properly. The right clothes for the right audience. Make sure you don't have any wrinkles on you. My family would call it salakomena in Greek, but if you're salakomena, I got to tell you, the Greek grandmothers are coming at you with, you know, they're going to try and iron you when you walk down the street because it's disrespectful. At least that's the way they see it. Believe me, my wonderful family has done this to me. So, you know, that's the key. Go out there and present yourself. Now, when you're speaking, if you say speak in a single tone and you don't stop, nobody's going to listen to you. But if you communicate and you make a point and you pause and you make your next point, and you vary your vocal tone several times, now you're going to have more executive presence. Now, if, if you sit here like this, you have no executive presence, but if we talk and you speak up more space, you've got more presence. So the only 7% is the content. So yes, 100%, it definitely matters what you look like and what you sound like. doesn't matter where you're at, remote or in the office. Good question. Simon, it seems like first you need to identify pain points, such as spending 25% of time searching for equipment. How can you determine these issues and quantify their percentages or impacts, Mike? Well, Simon, first thing is you have to know where to look. And without training, you're not going to know where to look because you have to understand business. But the CEO is going to tell you their pain points, hopefully. And if they don't know, because they're busy focused like me on strategy, I'm pretty sure their chief operating officer who runs the business is definitely going to know. And you're going to speak to them. Now, my hope is if you're a transformational architect, not just a techie that's just recommending stuff that people don't need, you're going to speak to the department heads. You're going to speak to the frontline workers. You're going to potentially even be speaking to the customers. And that's how you're going to understand more. Now, if you're a really good architect, like an enterprise architect, or you really understand transformation, you're going to go to the customer site. And you're going to sit there. And you're look, and you're going to open your eyes, and you're going to watch. And you're going to be real observant, and you're going to focus. And you're going to notice that all day people are running back and forth to see something, and you're going to figure out what the heck that is. So, you know, kind of keep that in the back of your mind. You have to know what to look for. And that's your training. It's just like a doctor or a nurse practitioner. You know, when I, I saw somebody with their jugular venous distension and their trachea shifting, and I was like, okay, this is an emergency. And people were like, what are you seeing? And I'm like, it's very subtle, but I know what to look for. And then I put a needle in the chest and uh, fixed their pneumo tension pneumothorax, and it got better. But you got to know where to look for. So think about it this way. The chef knows how to go figure out which food they need and which ingredients are going to make the perfect meal and which ones to combine. 
because they're trained in that. The architect is going to, especially an enterprise architect, is going to have to understand business processes. And they're going to have to be able to look for inefficiencies and they have to know how to ask the right questions. And I promise you, that takes a lot of training. And that's why our training is practically 800 hours at this point versus 20 hours for a certification. You may also see it on a financial statement. For example, if you look at a financial statement of an, air, of an airline, you might look at that fuel cost thing. You might go, boy, that's pretty scarily expensive. And then you might say, uh, how do you forecast your prices? Do you buy your fuel on options or options contracts? What have you done to try and uh, determine what the optimal buying time is? But, you know, that's why we spend so much time training our architects. But you have to know what to look for. And then you have to measure. And you have to know how to measure. So um, kind of keep that in the back of your mind. CI, are solution architects or enterprise architects still relevant after designing and implementing a digital transformational solution? Then I'll go to the next question, Michael. Well, two things. One is, uh, oh, they also do the engine. So let's, let's answer this question before the next question. Are solutions architect or enterprise architect still relevant? 100%. And as soon as the solution is designed, yes, the engineers and systems admins take over. Now, why is that? So, Alonzo, how many new pieces of news information come out that can affect business every single day? <laughs> oh, hundreds. <laughs> hundreds. Now, do it, are interest rates stable? Is the economy stable? Are people's buying patterns stable? No, none of this. OPEC cuts oil, the U.S. stops drilling for oil, and all of a sudden oil prices double. How does that affect organizations in the transport industry? You know, last year they may have been working on one project, now they've got another project. So business is an evolution. We make one new architecture, and as soon as that's done, well, you know, this architecture solved this problem, but now we've got this new problem to solve. Wait a second, interest rates just dropped by three basis points, by uh, three percentage points, and they probably will. And uh, now, oh, wow, we can go finance our hybrid cloud. And it's going to cost now a, a third or a quarter of what the public cloud is. Okay, let's bring everything back to the data center. Let's save some serious money. Or there could be an economic shift. Or there could be a war which prevents shipping from occurring in a certain part of the world. New architecture needs to occur. Wow, there's a new form of artificial intelligence that's a new competitive advantage. we got to get it faster than the other one. New project. So... Most of us, many of us, or most of us work for consultancies or vendors. And as soon as we design the solution for customer A, we're off to customer B, and then customer C, and then customer D, and then customer E, and then customer F, and we circle whatever it is. So we're never not designing. Now, that's most of us work for a consultancy or pre-sales where we're constantly doing that. But if we work for a customer, let's we'll say I was a CEO or a cloud architect at Target. You know, now it could be a new website project that we're going to help architect. Next year, it's going to be some special tagging. The year after that, it's going to be a customer appreciation thing. I don't know Target very well. It's not a store that I shop at, but I just thought it because they've got big signs everywhere. But they're big and they're huge and they're going to constantly have new adaptations. So you're going to always, always, always go over. And yes, the engineers and admins take over operations. And then when it breaks, another team goes and solves the problem. But we're already in a new customer or a new project. And because we generate revenue, we're typically the safest. CI, what's a typical day uh, slash week work like on a, uh, of a solution or enterprise architect in a non-OEM company? Okay, so understand a good percentage of us work in a company that makes systems or consults to companies, like, a, like an Accenture, Deloitte, KPMG, Capgemini. So if you want to get rid of all those millions of jobs, which we can do, now let's talk about it. So let's say I was the enterprise architect for a company I used to work for. Or So first thing I'm doing, let's say we were working on a new trading system. So what would I do when we were designing that new trading system? First thing that I would do is I would go to the CEO and find out how important that trading system is to that business. And this might take me a year, by the way, this whole thing. And then after I did that, uh, maybe I'm not answering your right question, but let's just say I would go to the CEO of the business. 
And then after that, I'd go to the chief technology officer, chief information officer. After that, I would go to the trading heads, the people that run the trading department. And then I would talk to the traders and figure out what they do. From there, I'd go build my team of engineers and architects to design the solution. I'd document the solution. I'd present it to the company's executives. Uh, they would say no. And I would say, what do I need to change? I'd make some changes and I'd present it back to the executive. Then we'd ultimately negotiate changes back and forth. Then we'd build the governance team. Then we'd build an implementation team. And then I'd, and then we'd be done, I'd be done with that project and somebody else, a program manager, would come in and de de manage the deployment. And typically it would be done. The engineering team would build it. And now I'd be working on the next project. It's now that the trading system's down. Now there's going to be some new internet optimization project. Do that, and as soon as that was done, there'd be some network optimization project. So it's going from project to project to project. Now, what is a typical day like? Well, it's going to be typically like this. You're going to have a lot of meetings. And the reason you're going to have to have a meetings is you need to understand what the executives care about and what the technology people can do. So I'd say if you work for an end customer and not a vendor or not a consulting company, about 25% of your time will be spent documenting whether that be in, in written format, explaining a solution and how it works, you'll be creating graphics, you'll be creating PowerPoint presentations. About 25% of your time, you're gonna be researching stuff. Looking for information, reading books, calling up vendors like Palo Alto to learn about their solution or Checkpoint to learn about their solution, Fortinet to learn about their solution. So I would say 25% research, that gets us to about 50% of the time. And so it's about 50% of the time in meetings so far and 50% uh, and, uh, of the time doing research. About 25% of your time is going to be doing documentation, taking notes, doing things. And about that other 25% of the time, it could be anything. You could be having lunch and dinner meetings, drinks with people, because you still have to know people in that organization. You could be asking people about their job and where the pain points are in their job and what they recommend to do about it so you can start crafting new solutions. You'll be managing vendors. You'll be managing stakeholders in some of these meetings to make sure that they're, they're bought in and things are good. You'll be collaborating with project managers so you can start thinking about creations of statements of work and resources that are going to need and timelines for deployments of your new architecture. You're going to be collaborating with those engineers and architects from across a wide variety of skill sets in order to be able to design the solution that you need and assess the organization's readiness for change. You might actually be communicating on change management or disaster recovery plans, but that's it. It's really going to be about 25% of your time is, is in meetings and 25% is doing research and 25% would be you know vendor and stakeholder management and the other 25% could be any of those things we talked about. Okay, from Folashaki, what percentage of your training is business versus technology? You know, I'd say it's about half and half. We have more, actually, we probably have more technical training than business training. And the reason we do that is we've got to get people to clear the interviews and pass the interviews. And a lot of those interviews are really technical training. So I'd say we do a little too much technical training but we save the other percentage of the time for business training. So about 50-50, which is about the role of the architect. Fola Shockey, when would an architect need to create a new statement of work? Anytime there's going to be a new project. We need to know how, what it's going to take to bring it together. So every new project, new statement of work. So I think that concludes all of our questions for today. Thank you so much for everyone for joining us. We hope you've been edified. You've got a new grip, a new handle on what cloud architects are, what enterprise architects do, and how it relates to your current career and where you want to go in your life. So please join us another time. We're happy and excited for you. Mike, please share any more information. Yeah, so I want to give you three free takeaways before you leave. Tomorrow on Zoom, which is great because we can all have face-to-face -face conversations and I love talking to people and I love helping people and I love consulting to people. We're gonna have a free webinar at 1 p.m. Eastern. 
at 6 p.m. UK time. And uh, it's going to be about how to get your first architect job. We will cover the entire skill set that you need to become a cloud architect. We will cover what hiring managers desire in the architect. We'll cover how to skip those HR people so you don't get auto-rejected when you lack experience. And we'll cover the entire skill set. It's going to be fun. We do it every Thursday. I personally love doing these. And it's free. So the link is in the description below and in the chat box. We also have a document that you might want to read, either before the webinar, after the webinar, and it's all the skills you need to get your first cloud architect job. And guess what? Again, it's completely free. The link is in the description as well as the chat box right now. And lastly, no matter what your career is, your tech skills are not enough, especially in the world in AI. So got a free document on why tech skills are not enough. Read that. Learn those really critical skills that you actually need. And guess what? You can seriously boost your income because these are the skills that will get you paid more. So it's been an honor spending the afternoon with you. Uh, I'm thrilled to see you all. And I hope to see so many more of you tomorrow. And we'll be back next week as well to help you build your cloud computing career. Take care, everyone. Thanks for joining us.